The reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 12. And then there's a short passage that's added to the outline uh, in 1 Corinthians 5 that we'll read following this. Exodus chapter 12, reading from the New King James Version this morning and beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Then verse 25 in the same chapter to verse 30. It will come to pass when you come to the land, which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service, that you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did so. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Turning then to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, just a short passage here. First Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, beginning in the middle of verse 7. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread 
of sincerity and truth. Yesterday, when we looked at Genesis chapter 22, we saw that we saw the lamb as the burnt offering. In the first place, that which is for God. When we look at Exodus chapter 12, the chapter that we have, or the passage that we've just read, we see that substitution comes to the forefront. Someone had to die, either the lamb or the firstborn. With the last verse we read, verse 30, it ended with, there was not a house in which there was not one dead. Shows us that everyone needs the Passover, needs Christ. The verses we read in 1 Corinthians show us what this passage means. The Passover lamb is the Lord Jesus. And Israel had to be saved out of Egypt. And God never saves by condoning sin. The Israelites were not sinless. They needed a substitute. They needed someone to die for them. And that is what we have here in this chapter, in this passage. So what we have here is bloodshed in order that there might be life. Now we know that when Israel left Egypt... There were 600,000 men. Probably five, 600,000 households, which would suggest to us that thousands of lambs would have been killed that night. But the remarkable thing is, in the passages that we have read, the lamb is always singular. We've read in the end of verse 4, a lamb. The end of verse Sorry, that's the end of verse 3. The end of verse 4, the Lamb. And then the beginning of verse verse 5, your Lamb. And it's very personal. It says in verse 3 again, each of you, every man needs the Lamb. Every man needs the blood of Christ in order to be saved. And we can look at the Lord Jesus, the features that we see in the Passover Lamb, But we also have read that the lamb was to be eaten, had to be assimilated. Christ is food for us. Our brother John reminded us of that in the ministry earlier in the conference. So that is one of the practical things we have here before us. Then the emphasis is put on the fact that this had to be a memorial every year. Now, I'm not saying that the Passover is the same thing as the breaking of bread, but the breaking of bread too is a remembrance, often, more than once a year. And that is something we can look into. And then we, at the end of the passage, God brings, draws our attention to the children. And I, I think, well, when we get to that, um, there are some very practical lessons in there, we see that God has an eye for the children, for the young people. When the Lord Jesus was here on earth, he said, let the children come to me. And here, God gives instruction and says, when your children ask, you explain. We have more verses to cover than yesterday. Yesterday, we, we made it through the passage, but we need to move a bit quicker, I think, in order to, to finish the verses that are before us. So let's look at the Lord Jesus as our substitute. There are three great types of use that word, or shadows, shadows of the good things to come, shadows, pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Exodus. Many, many all through the book of Exodus, but there are three that stand out, and that is 
Moses as the deliverer and mediator, the Passover, the Lamb, that we just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the tabernacle system itself. So just very briefly, just to give a little context here to what we're studying, where, uh, why the Passover, why here, why now, what's going on? You know, the Lord appeared to uh, Abram back in Genesis 15. He said, your people will be 400 years under slavery and bondage in a land, not theirs, <clears throat> in Egypt. And um, at the end of that period, uh, that they would be delivered from that bondage. It's striking, you know, we see Moses raised up now at the end of that 400-year period as the deliverer, remarkably delivered as a child. Pharaoh would have swallowed him up. We come to the New Testament after 400 silent years between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We see the deliverer born. And the enemy would have swallowed him up, Herod. But he was to be the savior, the, the one who delivered the people from their sins. But now we come to the time here, the Passover. And Moses uh, gets the instructions from the Lord. In verse 2, this month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Which I think actually the time would have been the seventh month on their secular calendar. But now it's on their festive calendar, this is the first month of the year. This is the beginning. And we could say this, I think, brothers and sisters, everything begins with the Lamb. Personally, it begins with the Lamb for each of us. When we come also to the end of the Bible, it ends with the Lamb. Revelation chapter 22, there. But there's a point I want to make out. There's this connection <clears throat> with also the other great type, the tabernacle system. Verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel. This is the first time we get that word. Some translations have assembly. <clears throat> we don't want to think of this in the terms of the New Testament assembly, which was still a mystery. But the idea here is the congregation, this corporate aspect. The people of God, just not as so many number of individuals, but actually a corporate collective identity called the congregation of Israel. First mention right here. And I think that's significant in connection with the Passover. Redemption. If we come over to Exodus chapter 25, we get the further purpose of the Lord. In this way, chapter 25 of Exodus, <clears throat> verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of its furnishings, so you shall make it. Let them make me a sanctuary. And then in chapter 29, at the very end, chapter 29, verse 46. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. You see, so with this tabernacle, the dwelling of God, where he dwells amongst the people. The other idea, too, is that the people would draw near to him. Of course, there was still that separation, but they... We're close. But the Lord would dwell among them. But before the Passover, we never get this. God appeared to individuals. He walked with Enoch. He walked with Abram, with Noah, with others as individuals. But the collective idea, this congregation, the sanctuary, only comes out when redemption comes in. And so that's, I guess, in a practical way for us, we're sitting here as believers. Yes, we have individual history of salvation, the Lamb of God. 
but yet we're part of a company, the redeemed congregation of the Lord. And so <clears throat> this is the wonderful truth that is brought out here. Everything begins with the lamb, but it's just not individual. He dwells with, his, with us, with his people, in our midst, and we can draw near now to him. Can I just say something about redemption? Because God is about to redeem his people here. Redemption is for those that are in bondage, slaves. And I think this is one of the best pictures of what redemption is. Redemption is different from purchase. When you purchase a slave, he becomes your slave. But when you redeem a slave, you pay his price and set him free. One time I met a missionary. He said uh, he belongs to an organization that go to Africa and physically redeem the slaves. So he said we go there, and he said very little price. I think then he said maybe 30 bucks, and you redeem him, you set him free. And this is what God is doing. Redemption is first by blood and then by power. So they were redeemed here by the blood of the Passover. When God appeared to Moses, he said, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, and I have heard their cry, and I'm come down to deliver them. So God is about to deliver them from bondage. The first Part of redemption again is by the blood of the Passover. They will sh shelter from the, um, the destroying angel. The blood shut him out. He could not enter into the house where the blood was. They were redeemed by the blood. But then the enemy was still around. He can, he can get them again, and this is what Pharaoh did. When they left, he changed his mind, and he went after them. And then they, there they were redeemed by power. When they came to the Red Sea, and the sea was before them, and the enemy behind them, and God uh, says to Moses, uh, stand still, or Moses said, and see the salvation of God. The Lord is going to fight for you, and you would hold your peace. And this is where redemption by power. And then right after when they crossed the sea and looked back and see the enemy drowning, then sang Moses and the children of Israel. The Lord is greatly triumphed. The horse and his, and his rider has cast into the sea. That is the full redemption. And when we look at the, 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 the New Testament now, the verse that many times repeated in, in First Peter, uh, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with a corruptible thing, but by incorruptible, by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's the first part of redemption. But then redemption by power, we can refer to Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 14, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that uh, he, by death, might destroy the power of death, but might destroy him that had the power of death, which is the devil, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So we were slaves in bond, um, in bondage to the enemy. And the Lord in power, he destroyed the devil by his own weapon. By death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. And another picture of redemption, which we're not going to refer to, is in the book of Ruth. The Redeemer 
must be a kinsman, the closest kinsman. And the verse we just quoted in Hebrews, he must take flesh and blood. He must be in all way, like his own brethren, in order to redeem us. He had to take the form of a man. One other thing. When he said to Moses, I am come down to deliver them, he didn't. Then God came down and uh, drove them out of Egypt. But he came down in the true Passover. God himself came physically down in the person of the Son, who is the true Passover and who is the deliverer that delivered. And today we would see the Lamb typified, pointing to no other but the Lord Jesus, our Redeemer. And the new beginning has already been referred to. The basis of the new beginning is the blood, the blood of the slain Lamb. We would also see the individual side as we were told to go ahead, uh, each household had to take a lamb. And the household could be too little for the lamb. It would tell us of the sufficiency of the lamb. And yet, we see the collective side that it is referred to as it. The whole assembly would kill the lamb. So we have both the individual and the collective side would be shown as we go through. But one other thought I'd like to point out here is that the lamb should be without blemish and without spot, pointing to no other but the Lord Jesus. He was without blemish and there was no spot upon him. just want to share a thought. What have motivated the heart of God to come on behalf of the people of God in Exodus chapter 12? Brother Brian had mentioned that there was words with Abraham about these 400, approximately 400 years. And I just don't want you to forget the purpose of 400 years because he said the reason for it. He says, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So dear saints of God, we can thank the Lord for his long suffering when we consider you and I. That perhaps he didn't come many years ago or else some of us will not be saved. The long suffering of God, even upon a people like the Amorites. But I want to say, share with you what motivated the heart of a sovereign God to act on the behalf of the Israelites. And I want to say it from chapter 3. He said to Moses, when he had every desire to send them out, he said these three aspects. I have seen their affliction. And when the Lord Jesus sees something, as far as the New Testament language, he moves with compassion. He saw the people as without a shepherd. They saw the, he saw the people that they might faint in the way, and he was moved from within with compassion. That compassion of God have impressed, if I can use that term, forgive me, I don't know a better language, a better word, the heart of God to move on behalf of his people, the compassion of God. But then he says, but I have heard their cry. And when we read in the scripture that God hears something, he acts in power. That's why prayer is so significant in the life of the saints of God. Because when God hears his people, he acts in power on their behalf. So, compassion, power, and the third aspect of it, for I know... Their sorrow, 
what they're going through, he moves with sympathy toward his own. So dear brethren, just think of these three aspects of it, of why the Lord comes in in Exodus 12, because of his compassion, because of his power, because of his sympathy toward his own, he will come in and introduce us to something, to a lamb, that definitely, I'm glad that we brought 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that it really speaks of the Lord Jesus himself. So the, the thought was God's. The plan was his. And it centered around the Lamb. The Lamb was a perfect substitute. In Genesis 22, the old King James says, God will provide himself a lamb. But a better translation, God will provide himself the lamb. The lamb. God had one lamb. As we have said earlier, one lamb. That was his blessed son, ever on his heart, before his heart, the one who would come into this world to be our substitute, a perfect substitute. We have said that Hebrews 2 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part. Not the whole part, not the sinful part. He ever was the perfect one, the lamb without spot, without blemish. The lamb had a head, he knew no sin. The lamb had legs, he did no sin. The lamb had inward parts, in him sin was not. A lamb selected. A lamb without spot, without blemish. What a lamb. What a lamb. Whenever we think of a lamb, we think of one that will suffer, one that will die. And as we gaze upon the Lord Jesus as the lamb we adoringly bow in worship at his sacrificial glory, the glory of the Lamb. We read here that this, is, this month shall be your beginning of months. And as we just heard, it was not the beginning of the months, it was the seventh. In our calendar, it's the seventh month, but in God's calendar, it's always He's the God of the new beginning. He's the God of the second and the third and the fourth chance for believers and for unbelievers too. He's always ready to start with us. Yesterday, we saw the sacrifice was for one person. Today, in Exodus 12, we see the sacrifice for a household. In Leviticus 16, we see the sacrifice for a nation. But then in John 1, 
we see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see here that it was in the 10th month, and uh, the number 10 speaks of the responsibility of man, that he was not able, but in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And as we just heard, the four days speak about him as the lamb without, without blemish. He uh, one time told the, the people, whom of you can rebuke me of a sin? And no one answered him until today. But uh, when Brother Paul at the outset read the um, verse 3, a lamb, and then verse 4, the lamb, and verse 5, your lamb. Alam is an indefinite article. The lamb was there in, in the eternity past, in the councils of God. Nobody knew about it. But then in the time we see the lamb, John pointed the lamb. But this is not enough. We have to appropriate that to ourselves. Your lamb. We have to put, apply the blood and the doorpost and the lentil. We have to eat from the lamb. Your Yesterday we looked at Isaac as the burnt offering sacrifice. And in the first chapter of Leviticus, we see how the burnt offering is holy for God. And all of it is burned up. But here we see the fire, the judgment of the lamb. It's not to be eaten raw. It's not to be boiled. It is to be roasted by fire. But it is our Passover lamb to be taken in. We didn't get roasted by fire the lamb was sacrificed for us. Wrap up a few of the comments that were made and, and move on. I'd li first like to make a small addition to what our brother Paul just pointed out with the head, the legs, and the inward parts. Paul, the learned man, he who had had a good ed education, he said he knew not sin. Peter, the practical man, he says he did know sin. And John, he had been in the Lord's bosom. He knew what was going on in the Lord. He says in him is no sin. We have heard that this lamb, and we've read that this lamb had to be a male. And it had to be one of a year old, which means that it was in the strength in the vigor of life. And Lord Jesus gave his life when he was about 33 years old. He prays, take me not away in the midst of my days. A sheep, so a ram or a goat. We saw yesterday that the ram speaks of dedication. We've also seen yesterday that the lamb speaks of not resisting. And we will get to that when we look at Isaiah chapter 53. But I want to focus a little bit on the goat. In the goat, we often link with the sin offering. But here, the goat is used for, can be used for the Passover lamb. It can also be used for the burnt offering. And I believe that the goat speaks to us of the ability to go where no one else could. You know, when you see these mountain goats, they're walking about, you know, on a, on a ledge about an inch wide or so. No one can go there, but a goat can. And the Lord Jesus went to a place where no one else could go, where he died in order that we might live. We have read that the blood had to be applied. The blood had to be shed, and we will come back to that later on. But then we have read about how the Passover had to be eaten. It was already pointed out that it had to be roasted by fire, exposed directly to the judgment of God. Not indirectly by boiling, but directly. And it had to be eaten. It needs to be assimilated. It, we need to make it our own. Whenever we talk about assimilation, I have to think of 
the example I think Mr. Hull used in explaining this. And he says there was this little boy who had a nice apple. There were some bullies around in the schoolyard who wanted that apple. So the boy starts running. And he knows they will catch up with me and take my apple. So while he is running, he starts eating the apple. So by the time they catch him, there is nothing to take. That's assimilation. He had assimilated the apple. It was part of him. And that's what we have here. Christ, our Passover, Christ, our food, we need to assimilate him. He needs to become part of us. And we, we all know, I guess, the expression, you are what you eat. And I think this is a very good uh, expression when we apply this spiritually. When we are occupied with the Lord Jesus, we will become more like him. So we need to feed on the lamb. The lamb is roasted by fire. That means Christ is judged. But it wasn't the only uh, item on the menu. We've read about the unleavened bread. That is sin judged. And then we also read that it had to be eaten with bitter herbs. That is self judged. And when we come together on the Lord's Day morning, we know that Christ has been judged. We know that sin in our life needs to be judged. Our self needs to be judged. Prove yourself and then come together. Brother Paul, if you don't mind, we might just emphasize a little bit of the the four days. You just pointed out he knew no sin. In him was no sin. He did no sin. Those four days that the lamb was kept were essential. There is a sense of appreciation that must take place in order for the individual household that is going to kill the lamb. It could not just simply be that you got the lamb in all of its perfection and that you just went ahead and killed it. There needed to be a period of contemplation. How essential I think it is for us to have that sense of contemplation of the greatness and richness of the Lamb of God's providing. The four Gospels bring before us somewhat of the features of the greatness of the Lamb. His whole life history set out before us. We have him uh, at birth. Then we have him at 12 years old. As he's in the temple and his parents are looking for him. And when they find him, his response is, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And then we see him on the banks of Jordan at the age of about 30. And we contemplate him there in light of how the father sees him. This is my beloved son. So those four days of contemplation are necessary in order for us to be able to apprehend and appreciate that which God has provided. Then there is another period of contemplation, I think, when it comes to the roasted lamb. There is the sense in which we must appreciate that this is the one whom God has provided as the only means of meeting the heart of God and the demand of God in regard to the matter of sin. So as we eat of the roasted lamb, we are also appreciating the fact that he's the one who God himself abandoned, abandoned of God, left alone. God 
bringing his judgment upon him when it comes ultimately to the matter of sin. So we eat of him in that sense as contemplating him in those four days and then as contemplating him as the roasted lamb, the lamb that met the fire directly and consumed it, the judgment of God must then move our hearts in a response of appreciation for the richness and greatness of divine provision. To continue the thought of Brother David, in verse 9, he points us that there is three parts we have to eat. Eat not, eat, of, uh, eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, and then his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. Three parts. And we have practically to eat from Christ. First of all, as the one who met the judgment of God, as we heard. And we have to eat of his head. Practically. This is what Paul said in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you. The mind of Christ. And what is the mind of Christ, dear brothers? It is the lowly mind. In Philippians 2, he says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. And then, let this mind be in you. And I think we all feel the need to always be nourished with the mind of Christ being lowly, accepting that others take our place or the better place in our assemblies. We need this. And then, second thing, his legs, his legs, how he walked, his perfect walk. We have to eat from this. We remember what Peter said in his first epistle. That we have to walk as he walked. He gave us his example. And uh, what Peter said at these verses in 1 Peter 2, he was speaking to the servants who were at that time suffering. And he said, accept suffering as the Lord has accepted. In his life, he accepted many sufferings. He went through many sufferings. Sometimes suffering for us is strange. But this was the life of Christ. His path was a path of suffering. And then the third thing, the pertinence or his bowels. His bowels. We heard about his compassion. He was moved with compassion. Many times we read in the Gospels how Christ was moved with compassion. First, for example, he saw the uh, crowd just as sheep without the uh, shepherd. He was moved with compassion. And I ask myself, when we look at non-believers all over around us, what is the effect in our bowels? How we are moved? Are we moved or not? Or are we just satisfied with what the Lord has given us in his grace? Also, uh, about his bowels, uh, it says, John said in his first epistle, chapter 2, if anyone says that he abides in him, 
look to Christ and he should walk as Christ walked. And then another point here in verse uh, 11. We find in, at the end of verse 11 in uh, Exodus 12. For the first time, the word Passover comes. What is the meaning of Passover? Uh, those who have studied the original Hebrew word, it has a very uh, interesting meaning. Passover in the Hebrew is Pascha. And in Egypt, we know this word, and it is familiar with us because the Hebrew and the Coptic are very near. They are of the same root. And what is the meaning of this word? It means like a bird who stretch, stretches its wings to protect, to protect the younger ones. And uh, there is a verse, an interesting verse in uh, Isaiah, 31, thank you. Isaiah 31, verse 5. Isaiah 31, verse 5. It says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. And it is the same word in Hebrew. And we can imagine what happened this night in Egypt. Uh, where there was the blood on the doorposts and on the uh, upper post, as if the Lord himself came and he stretched his wings and he protected all these houses. And death was not coming into the houses. And that happened through the work of the cross. We were under his protection. And we can sing what is said in Psalm 91, that we are in peace. And we can dwell in the Most High. We, he is our hiding place. A short comment on what uh, Brother Farid just mentioned. Uh, the word Passover, there are two words in Hebrew. One, we find it in verse 12, which is Abar, that is just passing through. And it's repeated in Joshua chapter 3 when the people passed the Jordan. But then the second word, which uh, it just heard about it, it's in verse 13, pass over you. And um, when you go to Verse 23 in, 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 in Exodus 12, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer. So here we can see two characters, two persons, the destroyer and, and the Lord. But the Lord did not only protect them as, as we heard from the judgment, but he bore himself the judgment. Why they were protected? Because he himself took our sin on the tree. In verse 11, we see that the Passover had to be eaten with the idea of leaving the country. It would have been no good for the people of Israel, for the congregation of Israel, to eat the Passover and then remain in Egypt. Our brother Wagdi has drawn our attention at the outset already to the fact that they were redeemed out of slavery out of Egypt. And the same thing applies to us. When we, are, when we were saved, we changed masters, we were redeemed, but there also has to be this aspect of going out of Egypt. Egypt, very often, sorry for all the Egyptian brethren among us, is a picture of the world, 
of that which is not good. And we know we cannot go out of this world, but we're no longer of this world. And I would like to link that. I know there is, a, there is more details to look at, but I would link that with the unleavened bread. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are very closely connected. I think it is in Luke chapter 22 where it says that the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Passover, was at hand. So we see that these two things are very closely connected. And that is why we read those two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And then he goes on, let's celebrate the feast. What's that feast? It's the feast of unleavened bread. It's the feast where there is no leaven. Leaven always speaks of sin. And what we see that it was seven days. Seven days without leaven. Seven is the number of completeness. It's a complete period where sin should not be present. Now I know we all have the flesh in us, the old man, which is still capable of sin, but that's not what the Lord wants. Our life, from the moment we were saved, should be characterized by the absence of sin. That's the unleavened bread. But then Paul uses, I think, a very important word. He says, let's celebrate the feast. In other words, let's be joyful. You cannot mourn and celebrate. And I think this is a challenge for us to celebrate, to be happy Christians. I know I've told this story before, but when I was a, a young boy, my parents went on holidays somewhere else where I'd never been before. Of course, I went with them, and we went to a meeting that I had never been at before, where all the brothers, you know, were there in, on the continent of Europe. The brothers sit separate from the sisters. Let's not get into that. But there was all these brothers sitting in their dark suits with their grim faces, and in the midst of them was one young brother dressed differently. But what really struck me was the smile on his face. He was different from all others. I noticed this. I was probably seven or eight years old, and I went to my father and said, who's this guy? My father didn't know, and he inquired, and it appeared that he was not from the assemblies originally, but he had been saved out of the world. He had come out of Egypt, and he had seen and experienced the difference, and he was a happy Christian. But the others were saved, redeemed, taken out of Egypt. You couldn't see they were happy Christians. But Paul says, let us celebrate the feast. Brothers and sisters, if we were all happy Christians, people would see this and would think, I want what he has. I want what she has. I believe that's one of the reasons why Paul uses that word there. Let's celebrate our Christian life, not for seven days. That's from when we get saved until we meet the Lord, either in the air or in paradise. But when we are saved, our life should be a celebration afterwards. Very briefly, to uh, carry that thought a little further, Paul, uh, I remember first time I ever went to a meeting I thought, someone die in here or something? Of course, I was coming from Pentecostal church, right? A little bit artificially pumped up, right? So we have to be careful of that. But point taken. It's a point. The joy of the Lord. But just another thought in connection with verse 11. Thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist and sandals on your feet and staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And Paul, you mentioned about the departure. It was in view of the departure. You know, 
I think it was mentioned also that the Lord's Supper is not the Passover, but it was drawn from it. And it is a memorial as well. The elements of it were taken, the Lord took, and brought out the Lord's Supper. And this is confirmed by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, where he says, I have received from the Lord. So he gets the message from glory as well, that on the same night in which he was prayed, took bread and so on. And he said, uh, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do announce the Lord's death till he come. The imminency of the Lord's coming is, how can I say it, the web and woof, if that's still an expression, of the Christian life. You know, the Thessalonians were converted to wait for the Son of God from heaven. They were converted to that. So every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, in a sense, figuratively, we have our staff in our hand, and our sandals on our feet, and our garments girded with the belt, ready to depart. We can leave at any time. And every time we have the Lord's Supper, and I have this thought sometimes, this could be the last one. Because we're going to be departing from the scene on some day. And we should have that thought, I think, with the Lord's Supper. That the view also of the Lord's coming and our imminent, imminent departure. Two scriptures along that line, um, how it was eaten uh, in haste and um, our attitude as pilgrims. We, don't, we do not belong to this scene. And uh, one scripture is in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse uh, 14. Stand therefore, having your lawns girded about with truth. And um, <clears throat> the next scripture is in um, 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 13. Wherefore, guard up the lawns of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Thus far. Just to uh, follow a little further again on these thoughts. And, and these scriptures, it wasn't in my thought, but it comes to mind what we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Not with malice, but with sincerity and truth. And I trust, I hope you will come to that, but, but I'll leave that for, for others. My thought was to follow on what Brother Paul was giving us, that, um, that there, was a, there was a deliverance anticipated. The, the Lord is giving them this preservation, but also in his very gracious provision, they're going to be leaving, and they're going to need some food. They're going to need to have the strength uh, for, this, for this departure, to, to leave Egypt behind. And uh, I, I want to come to what Brother Paul was saying, the response of the people in hearing of what the Lord was providing, but if you'll permit me, I'll just take a moment to get there. Um, what's happening here in chapter 12, the chronology of this part of Exodus is, is interesting because uh, it's clear that this direction from the Lord is given to Moses and Aaron at some point before the 10th day of the month, right? The, he said, on, when you get to the 10th day of the month, here's what you're going to do. And then when you get to the 14th day of the month, here's what you're going to do. And so evidently, chapter 12 has already been in, they've already been informed of this. But if we look back in chapter 10, uh, the plague of darkness, the plague just before, the last plague just before the Passover, uh, uh, Moses is in Pharaoh's presence. The plague of darkness has been upon the land of Egypt for three days. Evidently, it's those same 
days in which the lamb is already in the home. Because Pharaoh says in chapter 10, verse 28, I don't want to see you again. And Moses says, well, you won't. And in chapter 11, verse 4, Moses continues. Moses is still in Pharaoh's presence in verse 4. Chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, evidently also are earlier. And Moses says to Pharaoh, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. The Lord is going to bring judgment upon the firstborn of Egypt. Now in chapter 12, we find out that the Lord has already provided knowledge to Moses and Aaron of how this is going to take place. Turn back one moment to chapter 6. Probably some days before, maybe a couple of weeks or even longer than two weeks, two or three weeks, maybe more. Moses arrived in Egypt with Aaron. And in chapter 6, Moses and Aaron are speaking to the people. And they say there's going to be a redemption. The Lord says in verse 6, for example, I'm going to bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. I'm going to rescue you, redeem you. I'm going to take you as my people, verse 7. Uh, I'm going to bring you to the land which I have promised, verse 8. And in verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. The people could scarcely take in this, this truth of deliverance. Sorrow had overtaken them. Their anguish of spirit, their internal distress, and their external circumstances, the cruel bondage, prevented them from really taking in what was certainly true. They just could, could not really receive it. And sometimes it's this way for us, too. We, we are in great sorrow. We're in great distress. And someone brings us truth with a capital T. They tell us the truth, but it, sometimes we're not in a condition to, to receive it. But look at chapter 12 again now. We're going to get to these other verses, I trust. And in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 12, verse 21, Moses now calls for the elders of Israel, and he gives them the instruction that the Lord had given to him and Aaron. Again, this is now some period of time before the 10th day of the month. He says, here's what's going to happen. The Lord uh, has given this instruction, kill the Passover lamb, there's going to be deliverance, and so on. Verse 28, uh, end of verse 27, the people bowed their heads and worshipped. What is different from chapter 6 to chapter 12? Ah, the lamb. That's how this is going to be carried out. That's how this is going to actually come to pass. We heard that there was deliverance, but how could it be possible but the lamb is brought into the conversation and there's a response immediately. And just linking this now with what Brother Paul has said, to enjoy what God has provided, we bring the lamb into the conversation and what other response would there be but to respond with this kind of worship and, and thankfulness and joy and rejoicing you know, the people have been waiting for this deliverance, and all they know is Moses goes and talks to Pharaoh, and our lives get more difficult. But now there's the answer. The answer really comes with clarity. It's the lamb. All along, God had a plan. It's the lamb. And so I, I, I think that this last, you know, these day 10 to day 14 of this month, this was a, a period of, of rejoicing. There was light in their dwellings. If we link that with the three days of darkness, there was light in their homes. The lamb was in their homes. The anticipation of the Lord's deliverance was in their homes. And then they come to midnight and they eat that lamb, ready for that cry. It's time to leave. I would like to take a couple of minutes to as if we are in the house of one of the Israelites during those days. And the instruction, as we heard, the 10th day 
each house to bring a lamp. And uh, the instructions, the friends of the father bringing the lamb, getting into the house, and everybody asking, what's going on? What's going to happen? He tells them, the Lord will deliver us. Okay, so what the lamp has to do with this? Give them the instructions, what to do. The lamp has to be killed, and then the, the, the blood has to be applied at the door, and then at the night of the 14th day, the angel of the Lord will pass through the land. And he will kill the firstborn of the people, of the animals. If there is no blood, then the firstborn will die. I think all the family would really appreciate the lamb, right? Because this is the lamb that is going to die instead of the house. But I think we, I want to stop a little bit further and ask a question. Who of the house will appreciate the lamb the most? The firstborn. All of them know that there is a danger. But the firstborn is a hot spot of the story. And I think the firstborn will really appreciate the lamb to the uttermost. Because he knew, if this lamb is not there, at the 14th night, he will die. And I just want to bring this to our lives, and our remembrance meeting. If we keep this in mind as we remember the Lord, it wasn't the firstborn that was in danger in our situation. It was me. It's a big difference to celebrate a hero who saved somebody and to celebrate a hero who died for me. And this is what the Apostle Paul said, Son of God who loved me and gave himself for not for the whole nation, not for the whole house, but for me. And I think in our lives, some of us maybe five years in the faith, five, some people 10, 50, 70, God bless everybody. But as we continue in our life, I think this memory or this celebration becomes more and more fading but the Lord wants us to be always freshly reminded with our deep, desperate situation. We were in sin. We were in bondage. We were miserable. We had no hope. But there is a person. The Lamb of God was crucified and slain for me, to save me. If you allow me to... In our spiritual life, the Lord allows us to pass through some experiences to deepen the sensation of appreciation. More when we look at Him and appreciate His person and greatness of His love, but also sometimes to appreciate and to, so, to see the greatness of our sin. As we continue in our faith, as we mature in our relationship with the Lord, it always connected to see how bad and sinful our hearts are. Let me ask the question. Peter, does he appreciate the Lord more before his fall or after his fall? Sometimes the Lord allows us to experience how bad we are to appreciate more his love and his sacrifice. They were to rejoice and to worship, although they haven't seen the result yet. And we are redeemed, our souls are redeemed, but the full redemption is to come, the redemption of our bodies. But we still are to rejoice, 
I think of the verse that in First Peter, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though ye see him not, but believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So the joy in eating the Passover and the joy of worship was accompanied by faith. They believed what Moses have told them, that the angel is not going to come close to them because of the blood that was in the doorpost and the upper lintel. And another thing about the blood, God says, I will see the blood and pass over you. He is the only one that knows the value of this blood. It is not for the Israelite and sit there and meditate on the blood, no. The Israelite is to enjoy feeding upon the Passover lamb. But only God knows the value of that precious blood. If you go to the tabernacle, in the great day of atonement, Aaron was to get into the second part in the Holy of Holies, only with blood. And he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. What is on the mercy seat? There are two cherubims looking down. Cherubims speak of the judgment of God, and they look down. What do they see? They see the blood. He said, you sprinkle it once on the mercy seat and seven times before the mercy seat. One time was good enough for God. He knows the value of the blood, and I would see the blood and pass over you. But before the mercy seat where the people are, he says as if you tell them, believe on the blood, believe on the blood, believe on the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. We believe that this blood that the Lord had shed on the cross cleanses from all sin. Not one sin that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cannot forgive, cannot save. And we say this to anyone here who has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably you think you're too bad. Maybe. You've done many things that are too much to be saved. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. In Colossians he says, Heaven forgiven you for all your trespasses. doesn't matter what they are. doesn't matter what kind of trespasses, but they're all forgiven because of the precious blood of the Lamb. So the, um, the last clause of verse 30, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So by contrast, by Contrast, we see consequence. Um, Brother Wagdy just spoke that some might think they're too, they're too bad for this, but some of the Egyptians would have probably thought they were too good. They didn't need this. Um, Pharaoh was warned that this was going to happen, but they didn't see the need for the lamb. They didn't see the, and this was a whole exercise. This is the first time that they're given this whole exercise to go find the lamb, observe, observe the lamb. They were told how to prepare the lamb, how to eat the lamb. This is a, a, a huge undertaking. But you had to see that there was a need for yourself to do this. And um, so that's how it would be applied to you, and you'd be uh, saved from the sure judgment. And this also shows that God's word is true and that his word is sure. There was a consequence, and all of the Egyptians felt that. In connection with verses 13 and 14. The blood was applied on the outside of the houses. In verse 22 it says that they were not to go out of the houses. So they were inside. They didn't see the blood. But God says, as a brother Wagley has drawn attention to it, when I see the blood... Now, I'm a firstborn son, so the stories always appeal to me. And I, I thought, you know, imagine 
Just like we just said. Imagine you're there. What would you think as the firstborn son? You know, you can be very confident. Say, this is what God says. And I'm okay. Nothing is going to happen to me. But I know there are many believers, especially young in faith, who do not have that confidence. So, well, maybe there's not enough blood. Maybe it's not applied appropriately. Maybe my father's done it wrong. But that's not the point, God says. God doesn't say there needs to be so many square inches or centimeters for those from Canada and Europe. He doesn't say it needs to be tw done twice. He says, when I see the blood, it's not about how I feel about being saved. It is about what God sees. When you're behind that door where the blood is applied, you are safe. That is the message that God gives the Israelites. So, if there is someone here today who is struggling with assurance, here we have the answer. The blood is there. And God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Judgment has been executed. It doesn't matter how you feel. Satan will tell you that. You're not good enough. You, you don't have the certainty. You'll not go to heaven. I've been there. But God says, when I see the blood, that is sufficient. And in relation to verse 14, God says, this day shall be to you a memorial. The root here of the word in Hebrew is linked with burning incense. So on the one hand, God says, I want you to celebrate this, and I want you to enjoy this. But the flip side of the coin is, when you do that, God says, I will enjoy it. And this was not for some Israelites. It was for all Israelites. God went as far as to say, anyone who does not celebrate this, he'll be killed. Now let's make the link to the remembrance meeting, announcing the Lord's death. That is for all Christians, for all believers. And if there's someone here today who has not responded to that request of the Lord, do this in remembrance of me. Our brother Brian has told us that there will come a point in time where time is no more for us, when we can no longer do this. Because it is until he comes. He wants us to remember his death. When the, the first people were saved and added to the church in Acts chapter 2, it says of them that they persevered in four things. And one of them was the breaking of bread. It's normal Christian behavior. There is no excuse. If you say, well, there's something in my life that prevents me from breaking bread, Scripture says, sort it out. If you say, well, there is someone there that I have an issue with, I cannot break bread, Scripture says, sort it out. Someone will say, well, you know, um, this, this Sunday I cannot break bread because... This, that, that individual, Scripture says, reconcile, bring your sacrifice, break bread. This is for every believer. And if there is someone here who doesn't do it, I would challenge you to honor that request. And if you have questions about it, there are plenty of brothers here who would be willing to help you to put this request of the Lord into practice. The fact that God says you ought to do this, you have to do this, shows also that he appreciates the Israelites being occupied with the Lamb. And today, the Father appreciates it when we are occupied with the Son. The whole New Testament is God speaking to us and displaying to us his Son. Should we not honor his son's request.
Um, I'm thankful for these studies. Really enjoy them. I just wanted to bring the point that in our in our study it says to uh, teaching our children the things of the Lord. And I thought we we didn't spend a lot of time on teaching the things of the Lord. And I see right here in the household they had to be all together in the house. And um, I can just imagine the children looking at the eldest to see if he was going to die or not. Right. And um, it, it's it's an exercise as parents we need to to uh, really teach our children the things of the Lord. And, um, uh, and, and as a, the memorial we just talked about, remembering the Lord with our children, right, as a household. Here, as a ho- they, they said as a household, it doesn't show as a, uh, an assembly or anything. It shows that, uh, as a household um, that we need to open the, the word of God uh, in our households as well and uh, to, to present it to our children. I just wanted to, to see that. It made me think of Joshua in Joshua 4 where uh, they had to take the stones uh, going through and then in verse 6 um, or even before um, the instruction was to um, yeah and each one of you take up a stone and on the shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come saying what do these stones mean to you so they had to take that stone as a memorial because we know how we are we for, we're forgetful and we're thankful that we can do remember every Sunday morning, once a week, um, it's important to come together and, and remember the Lord and, and take our children with us, right? And, and then if, if we don't practice these things at home, our children, are they going to ask us the questions, why are we doing this, right? So it's, impo- it's very important, I think, to, um, uh, to teach our children, bring them up and, uh, to the, in the appreciation of the Lord. Same, exact same line um, to say a little further. In verse 24, to carry on this point of the memorial, you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. And, and here the word sons is mentioned. Uh, just kind of scan back verse um, 3. It was houses, households. And it was to be observed in the context of the family, as we've said. Uh, We didn't mention this, but it's often noted that it never was the case that the lamb was not enough for the household. The household might not be sufficient to consume the lamb, so you would bring another family in with you. But the lamb is always sufficient for the household. And then there's uh, the generations in verse 14. Throughout your generations... From the very institution, the very beginning, when God first reveals this uh, instruction to Moses and Aaron, he's already thinking ahead. The details from verse 14 um, on to really verse 20 are are not for Egypt. They're for keeping this memorial. He has already in mind this memorial. In verse 24, it's, it's the sons. And I think perhaps it's to emphasize that uh, the sons were... The firstborn son was the the first to be concerned about this. We have this mention of the destroyer in verse 23. Sometimes this chapter is mentioned, and just a little side note, uh, we hear the expression, the angel of death passed through. We don't really see such an expression in this chapter. Uh, In rabbinic literature and in Jewish folklore, there's an angel of death who goes around, you know, doing his thing. Um, but it's the Lord who was passing through, and he's not allowing the destroyer to come into the houses. It's as if the destroyer is saying, I know who's in that house. I know they deserve to have a death. I know who's there. The Lord says, yes, but you can't go in that house. That house has the blood. And so the sons are specially emphasized in verse 24. And then there's the children in verse 26. And I really appreciate this line that we're on, and, and it would be good to, perhaps, if I may suggest, to just not leave this too quickly. In our homes, what are we doing to intentionally create situations, occasions, when these matters come up? In a, in an, a Jewish home, on this moment, of the people of Israel, 
some things were changing. And some things were going to be, be put away when the, when the Passover memorial was going to be observed. Every year, they would stop working. Work was not going to dictate what's going to take place to keep this memorial. This memorial was going to take precedence. Now, I'm not trying to meddle, at least not yet anyway. I'm sure we'll get to some meddling uh, in our comments as to how we take this to our consciences. It's not always possible. We realize some uh, people have employment that is, uh, we appreciate those who have employment that we need in, in certain situations on, let's say, on a Sunday morning. But that's not what I'm trying to get at now. But the fact that there is a priority. Something is, is going to organize or order the, the things that take place. And, and work was going to stop. Verse 16 mentions this. And then certain things were not going to be found in the home. The atmosphere of the home was going to be different from, you know, an ordinary lifestyle, an ordinary, uh, you know, the next, the next house over. And... Things were going to be done so that the children, verse 26, intentionally inviting questions and intentionally having an answer prepared so that when the children say, what are we doing this for? They don't say, well, this is just what we do. Just take it by faith. Just believe it. There's an answer. There's a, a very meaningful answer. The Lord, he passed over our houses he delivered us. We want to honor him in this memorial. And so there were things that were going to be different, intentionally different, so that the generations to come would have the experience of personalizing this. Normal living would be changed. Normal life would be interrupted by the keeping of this memorial. I suppose that we have found many ways in recent years in which we can disrupt our lives as little as possible to observe spiritual things. Spiritual things fit in around our agendas and not the other way around. And things that we did ordinarily five years ago we do differently, perhaps, today, because we can, because it's convenient, because it's easy. And in the days of the Passover, things were interrupted by that which was going to bring honor to the Lord and bring something meaningful to our hearts. And in our households, we have that great privilege to do things intentionally, to let the family know this is who we are. The Lord has delivered us, and we want to give place to his rights, to his honor, and to his memorial to remember who he is. We have our identity because of what he has done for us. I'm sorry, Brother Ricky. The question is, how did we get to this point? And I was just sitting there thinking about it, because with each plague that came along, you could see that the children of Israel saying, man, things are just getting harder and harder. It would have been best if you had just left us and we would have been in slavery and it would just, everything would have just been quiet and nice because things started getting harder for them. And then the magicians came along and they started to imitate God's power. And they were imitating God's power by using Satan's power. And that's what the world does today. They try to imitate the things of God and give us a false sense of how things are. But I tell you, there is no substitute for the lamb. There is no substitute for the blood. There is no, as much as the world would try to substitute things. There is nothing like the lamb. And, you know, we were talking about the family. And one of the thoughts that has come to me 
is that unfortunately we try to substitute things. Now I came from a poor family from the West Indies in the Caribbean. And one of the things is that you as your family, uh, I as a parent, I would like to see my daughter do better than what I had. And in the pursuit of things, what has happened is that because we want to see our children do better, we have allowed things like education, and we have allowed things like jobs and profession to take the place of things concerning the Lord. And what has happened is that, yes, we want to see them go to good schools. Yes, we want to see them go to great universities. Yes, we want to see them get better. But many have done this at the cost of having them seek the things of the Lord. You know, sometimes we say, oh, there's a conference but we have our children seek their education over the conference. Oh, there's the breaking of bread. Oh, there's the Sunday school. My son and daughter have practice. Oh, they have to go to a sporting event. They have to do this. And the things of Christ are placed in the back. Once again, I'll say there is no substitute for the Lamb. And we have to show our children and show our families that the Lamb is the center. It begins with the Lamb. This is a new beginning. It begins with Christ and Christ as the Lamb. And when we show our children and our families that Christ is the center of our households, I tell you, it makes a difference. So just remember that Christ is the Lamb, and there is no substitute for him. I probably would just say a bit more with what Brother Steve and Brother Vera was going into. What struck me is that, you know, God is a God who wants generations, and he wants generations for himself. And really what he wants to do is perpetuate generations in our homes and in our lives. I was thinking, and I'll correlate more with verse 20 to 28, but I was thinking of Psalm 78. I'll just read a couple of verses from there. Psalm 78, verses 6 and 7. That the gener Psalm 78, verses 6, 7. That the generations to come might know them, the children that they should be born, that they might rise up and tell them to their children, and that they might set their hope for God, and not forget the works of God, but observe his commandments. And so what God wants to do is set the Lamb at the center of our lives and of our homes, and in such he wants to perpetuate generations that would have hope in him. And I think that that is the ultimate, because we want our children, and should the Lord tarry, our children's children to have hope in this land. And what struck me too is, is that, you know, there's always this idea of how God blesses homes that put him at the center and then him that obey him. Um, because when you get to verse 28, and the children of Israel went away as Jehovah had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. And so there is this idea of obedience, this idea of having him at the center of our homes, and this idea of teaching our children, and also teaching them about the Lamb and putting their hope in him. Verse 26, for when your children shall say unto you, there's a Jewish tradition with this of uh, two questions, or at least the way that it's asked. It's uh, when your children ask, why 
do we do this? Or the children ask, why do you do this? And it's the answer corresponds to this is if it's uh, why do you do this, it signifies that the child's not taking part. And if the child asks, why do we do this, this signifies his ownership in, the, in this. And this goes back to what's been said by the last four or five brothers of teaching our children. You know, teaching the young people in our meetings if you don't have your own children. That why do we do what we do it's for the Lord? So we have a ready answer, as been mentioned. A quick thought in relationship to what the brethren are talking, but I want to bring it as far as the blood. There is one person that has seen the blood from the outside, beside God. God saw it during the judgment time. But there is a person that saw the blood from the outside, the one that applied it. And perhaps it is the father of the household. So what am I going to teach my children in the Christian era? What is the thing that I want to teach him and teach her? And I would like to suggest, dear brethren, yes, he passed over us, but probably a lot of the Jewish still teach the same thing. But I want to take how the blood was applied to teach our children that. There was, first of all, that I want to draw their attention that there is power, power, wondrous working power in the blood of the Lamb. I want to draw their attention that God has provided a mean the blood of a lamb that is absolutely so powerful and so wonderful to change you and me. That's the first lesson. I want them to be drawn to the blood. But now when you read how the blood was applied, we have a spiritual lesson that I could learn why the Spirit of God bringing a basin. You see, it seems to me that Moses now brought a basin and he says, Although you don't treat it in the early part. But it says, I want the blood in the basin. And from that basin, you take the blood and apply it. I want to teach my children that Christ died for all. That's the basin. That's the blood in the basin that speaks that Christ died for every individual. And he is sufficient to save anyone that will come to him. He died for the world. He died for all. But then the Spirit of God says, I want you to apply it in two, place, two locations. One is the lentil, which is individual. But then the doorpost, the two doorposts, which is more than one. The second thing that I would love to teach my children, and I really believe, dear brethren, we can teach them in that line of thing. That do you, can you say, my child, that the blood has been applied upon the lentil means Christ not only died for the world or for all, but Christ died for me. Do you know Christ Jesus, that one that died for you, that the blood has been applied on the lentil? So in the basin, it's for all. On the lentil, Christ died for me. And then you come to the doorpost and say, what is this, Brother John? How are we, how we going to bring that application the next lesson that we desire to teach our children, that there is those that Christ died for us. There is the Old Testament and the New Testament saints that Christ died for us. This is where I want to impress my children, that the, the Lord died for all. But he didn't die only for me. He died for us as a redeemed company so that I can introduce them to a company that is redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb and impress upon them the importance of being with the people of God that have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. I think one important thing we see here is that God expects the children to ask questions. The children were here, I would say to them, follow the Lord's example. 
When he was at the temple as a 12-year-old, he was hearing the scribes and asking them questions. God puts value and importance on the fact that children ask questions. So much so that we find this at least, Brother John will always say, be careful with your numbers, say approximately. So at least four times God gives this instruction. We have it here in Exodus chapter 12 in relation to the Passover. We have it in the next chapter in relation to ransoming the firstborn. And the firstborn are then connected in Numbers chapter 3 with the Levites. It speaks of service. So we have questions in relation to service. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when Moses has pointed out the, the statutes and the rules and everything that God wanted Israel to know and to do, God says, and when your children ask, what does this mean? What does the Bible teach? What does this mean? And then the last time, our brother Ben has already referred to it, Rin Gilgal. And these stones are set up. What does this mean? And what happened in Gilgal, after every battle, they came back. What had happened before they went to battle is circumcision. Judgment of self which is of vital importance for us. And God says to the children, ask questions. But when the children ask questions, there needs to be an answer. And we as parents, God says, we have to answer. Now, how can you answer a question if you don't know the answer to it? That means that we as parents need to know why we do the things we do. It's no excuse to say, well, I grew up in the meetings. And I've heard brothers say to me, you know, I never looked at the assembly principles until we had a problem. And I was 40 years old and I didn't really know what to do. Uh, then you, if, if, you, if you have that attitude, you cannot explain these things to your children. So in order to be able to explain the things to our children, to our grandchildren, to the, pe the young people in the meeting, we need to have appropriated these things ourselves. We need to have occupied ourselves with the things of the Lord. It's not like Brother Steve said, well, this is just how we do things. No, we need to have our convictions. And if we do not have our convictions, we will not appreciate what we do. One sister once complained and said, you know, I cannot get my children to come to the meeting with you, with me. They just do not want to go. And another sister said to her, so well, what's your attitude when you go to the meeting? Are you anticipating this? Are you enjoying being there where the Lord is? Or are you going because it happens to be Sunday? If we have the attitude of let's go there where the Lord is, let's celebrate the feast, our children will see this. And when our children see that mom and dad enjoy being there where they might not understand everything, they will follow. They want to be there where mom and dad are happy. And when this sister had thought about this, she went to the meeting with a different attitude, and this had an effect on her children. Our children look up to us. They look up to their grandparents. They see how they behave, how we behave. Let's set the right example when it comes to the things of the Lord so that our children have something good to imitate. I wonder what's the climax of all of this? We've had the entire chapter opened up to us. The lamb held for four days the spirit of contemplation 
the firstborn realizing that unless this lamb is killed, he would be killed. Solomon. We saw the roasted lamb. Another aspect of contemplation we said. Then we saw Jehovah executing judgment. Then we are introduced to the fact that it's a memorial. And then we just had the challenge as to the impact upon our children. How are they going to respond? Lastly, I wondered what's going to be our response. And I thought of just the expression that closes out at the end of verse 27. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. I wonder if that's not the culmination of this kind of an exercise of the Lamb. Bowing our heads. You'd remember that when the completion of the walls in Nehemiah's day, and in chapter 8, when the word was opened up by Ezra, it says, the people stood up. A sense of holy reverence. I wonder if that's the holy reverence that should occur with us today. The bowing of the heads and the spirit of worship, which is the greatness and glory of the Lamb that comes before us and causes a humbling response that God has so richly provided in the blessed person of Christ, the Lamb of God's provision. to that earlier expression in verse 27. It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord. And that is a question we might have from our children because we heard earlier that redemption is deliverance out of slavery. And one might wonder, who is the price paid to? Is it paid to the slave master, Pharaoh? No, what we saw here is that unlike in the previous plague where there was light in the dwelling of the Israelites, here the whole Egypt was under condemnation. The firstborn of the Israelites was as much in danger as the firstborn of the Egyptians. The whole world sits under sin and as such deserves condemnation. He who believes, John 3, 6, uh, John 3 uh, 18, he who believes is saved, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Right? That's where we started from. The wrath of God was on all of us. But the Lord said, I will see the blood. I see the blood. The blood is for the Lord. He is the one who received the precious blood of the Lamb of God. When we were redeemed by this incorruptible blood, it was paid to Him. And that's a simple answer to give our children when they wonder about these things. To the Lord in our hearts and um, also produced security and certainty and enjoyment. There is a nice article by, by George Cutting. You find it on, on STEM publishing. You can download it for, for free um, for the believers. When, we, when they go inside and outside the door, they see the blood. It's it, the door of the house. It's a daily, a daily interaction going in and out. Appreciation, continuous appreciation for what the Lord did. But in, um, 
as it, it, as it produced the, produce this um, appreciation, but also it's a ring, it rings a bell of warning. We don't see the blood on the doorstep, but we can read about it as a warning in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trample, trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common sin and insulted the Spirit of God. May the Lord help us that we enjoy this as individuals and as a household that none of our children will keep the blood on the doorstep but have it in the lentil and the door. This will conclude our study for today. And uh, parents can go get your children and we'll have a time of prayer.